Finally, Starliner has returned, empty but intact. This is Boeing's long-awaited sigh of relief, and NASA is brimming with pride. But the burning question remains, did Starliner truly deliver a stellar performance? Has it proven its reliability? Or this return actually revealed more problems than we already knew? Let's find out in today's episode. Trovi after years of delays and setbacks, Boeing's Starliner spacecraft has finally completed its critical test flight to the International Space Station, ISS. On the evening of Friday, September 6th, Starliner departed from the ISS without a crew on board. As scheduled, Starliner undocked from the ISS at 6.04 p.m. EDT, beginning its tense journey back to Earth. Five hours later, at 11.17 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, the spacecraft performed a crucial 59-second deorbit burn. NASA and Boeing engineers must have been holding their breath as they closely monitored the telemetry data on NASA's live feed, watching the thrusters fire as expected. The next key moment came with the separation of the service module and the execution of the handling burn. Finally, at 12.01 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Starliner safely touched down at White Sands Space Harbor in New Mexico, finishing its return to Earth. In the post-landing press conference, NASA official Steve Stitch shared quite a bit of insight into Starliner's landing process. Stitch mentioned that when Starliner departed the ISS, it executed a breakout sequence. It's the first time we've used that to back away from the station, he said. We backed out to about 5 meters and then did a series of about 12 burns using the service module forward jets. After that sequence of maneuvers, we ended up opening at about 22 kilometers per orbit away from the space station. All those thrusters did really well through that SEP solar electric propulsion sequence. No problems at all. There were no fail-offs or any problems at all. We had great performance from the GNC system, the guidance navigation control, and the VESTA navigation and docking system. Stick said. Last flight on Orbital Flight Test 2, we had a little bit of trouble with what we call a calibration maneuver to really make sure that the attitude is good for this space-integrated GPS INS SIGI system, and that went really well. We had a deorbit burn that executed on time at 11.17 p.m. Central. It was about 130 meters per second, a 58-second burn. It was a really good burn, and the service module thrusters performed well for that burn, and the OMAX engines performed well. The return and landing marked the end of Starliner's test flight to the International Space Station over three months after the spacecraft suffered a helium leak and thruster malfunctions on June 6, right after launch. So, do you think Starliner delivered an impressive performance? Boeing bringing the spacecraft back intact is a good thing. At least no damage occurred. But does that make it a safe spacecraft? Number absolutely not. Let me explain. While Boeing and NASA have tried to paint this flight as a success, the truth behind these optimistic statements is actually quite alarming. During the deorbit burn, Steve Stick revealed that the engineering team observed unusually high temperatures in the doghouse on the starboard side, a section housing clusters of thrusters. Specifically, one thruster in each of the starboard and top doghouses at a little higher temperature than expected. Although none of the thrusters completely failed, the fact that they overheated is still a serious concern. In fact, this overheating issue with the doghouse is not new. It's the very reason astronauts didn't fly back home on Starliner in the first place. The point is, why is it that during Starliner's journey to the ISS, when the overheating occurred, the doghouse thrusters automatically shut down, and astronauts had to manually recover them? But during re-entry, they didn't shut down at all. Boeing utilized a breakout sequence to help the spacecraft quickly separate from the ISS, minimizing the time spent near the station and reducing the risk of collision. By this method, the thrusters didn't have to operate continuously for long periods, which helped ease the stress and reduce the temperature buildup on them. But the overheating issue still occurred. With no crew on board to manually intervene, how did these thrusters keep running? There are two possible theories here. One, the overheating remained within an acceptable threshold allowing the thrusters to continue functioning. Two, the thrusters got too hot and should have been disabled by the software's safety protocols. However, during Starliner's configuration adjustments, Boeing might have disabled the fail-safe mechanism that protects the thrusters from overheating. Meaning, no matter how hot the thrusters got, it wouldn't automatically shut off. If Theory 1 is true, at least Boeing has found a workable solution to bring Starliner back safely. But if Theory 2 is accurate, this would be an alarming and unethical trick, a severe violation of engineering integrity. Anyway, I firmly believe that this doghouse design is not flying again. Initially, this structure was supposed to protect the thrusters throughout the journey. However, the reality turned out to be the opposite. Instead of shielding them, it trapped heat, leading to dangerous overheating in the thruster clusters. But the thruster issues didn't stop there. A completely new problem emerged. One of the 12 thrusters on the crew module, 
specifically an upward firing thruster, failed to activate during a hot fire test right before re-entry. Previously, most of the concerns had been focused on the service module thrusters, but this new failure shows that even the thrusters on the crew module aren't reliable. What's even more worrying is that no one has pinpointed the exact cause of this issue. Stich claimed that Starliner performed great during re-entry, but that one thruster didn't work at all. That's a very diplomatic way of saying there's a serious problem. These crew module thrusters are absolutely crucial to the survival of the spacecraft. They help orient the ship, ensuring it uses lift to gradually re-enter the atmosphere, reducing heat buildup, the maximum g-forces on the crew, and minimizing max Q during re-entry. The capsule enters the atmosphere at a shallower angle compared to an uncontrolled ballistic trajectory, making the descent safer. You know what? If you just drop the spacecraft into the atmosphere, the g-forces on the crew will spike, the heat on the shield will rise, and the the atmospheric drag will increase, causing quicker wear on the heat shield. Without these thrusters on the crew module, the spacecraft wouldn't be properly oriented. I'm not saying the ship would be lost immediately, but it's definitely bad news. And NASA seems to have been quite strategic in not mentioning this problem too much. On top of that, Boeing's Starliner has also faced guidance system issues. According to Stick, two out of three SIGI systems, Space Integrated GPS Inertial Navigation System, encountered malfunctions. Specifically, the third of the triple redundant CG navigation systems temporarily failed during landing, and the second one also had a few hiccups during re-entry. They're now investigating these problems in detail. During landing, the SIGI system plays a critical role in keeping the spacecraft correctly oriented as it re-enters Earth's atmosphere, a phase that's highly sensitive sensitive and packed with potential risks. If this system were to completely fail, Starliner could lose attitude control, leading to possibly catastrophic consequences. Two out of three navigation systems malfunctioned, leaving only one functioning properly. If that last one had also failed, Starliner's return could have been disastrous. Fortunately, Starliner was designed with redundant backups for both its propulsion and SIGI navigation systems. Thanks to this, the spacecraft was able to complete its journey back to Earth safely. But just imagine if one of these two important systems had fully collapsed. The return mission would have ended in failure. So, Starliner landing successfully doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. The space shuttle had dozens of safe missions before disaster struck. A single intact landing doesn't prove safety. It just shows that this time, the redundancies worked. NASA stated that this mission of Starliner met about 90% of its objectives. Well, I have to admire their optimism. Boeing was notably absent from the press conference following Starliner's return, a move that can only be seen as a bit of a sulk. It seems there's some bad blood brewing between Boeing and NASA. It seems like the two organizations have been at odds over risk assessments. Risk evaluation is actually very subjective. If two experts are given the same task, they might come up with different assessments. Maybe NASA estimated the mission risk at about 1 in 200, 0.5%, while Boeing argued it was closer to 1 in 270, 0.37%, the standard at which a spacecraft is allowed to carry humans. Regardless, this return will undoubtedly spark a new wave of investigations into both existing and newly discovered issues with the spacecraft. We've been entirely focused this summer on understanding what is happening on orbit, trying to decide if we could bring the crew back or not, Stick said. What we need to do now is really lay out the overall plan, which we have not had time to do. With this latest mission providing a wealth of new data, the next step is a comprehensive review of the spacecraft. Boeing will need to demonstrate a full understanding of all issues and propose effective solutions. It's highly likely that Starliner will need another test flight, and the outcomes of these investigations will determine if the next mission will be a crewed flight. All right, that's it for today. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more in-depth looks at the latest advancements in space technology. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.